Welcome to Kadampa Podcasts. These podcasts offer practical solutions to daily challenges and help guide us to a happier and more peaceful state of mind. In each episode, you will find an extract from a teaching given by one of various Kadampa Buddhist teachers worldwide. All these teachings are inspired by the profound wisdom of Venerable Geshe Kalsan Gyatso Rinpoche, a Buddhist master for our time. We hope you will enjoy listening. Are you appearing to your mind? You're actually always appearing to your mind. There's always a sense of self. Would you agree with that? It's not like necessarily like a visual cutout image, but you just, you're aware that you are here. I mean, you're not here, I'm here. You're there. That's how, you, that's how we feel it, right? Like you don't suddenly get confused, right? And go, wait, wait, am I you? No. We're, we're, there's a sense of self. And that self... Well, you're looking at it, because every now and then it'll be a happy self. And you're like going, oh, I'm happy. And then sometimes it'll be an unhappy self. And you'll go, oh, I'm unhappy. And sometimes you'll look at that self, and it'll feel like maybe like, some, like it's a, unhappiness may, might be a regularly occurring tendency. Or anxiety might be a regularly occurring tendency. So you're going to be looking at that unhappy self or anxious self, and you're going, yeah, that's kind of who I am. That's, that's the real me. Beneath the, hey, how you doing, I'm great, there's this not-so-great self. That's the real me. So in other words, you're perceiving yourself as having an objective existence. There's a contradiction right there in the, in the phrase. You are perceiving yourself as having an objective, limited existence in some form or another. You're not seeing yourself as a potential Buddha. You're not seeing yourself, your mind as being vast as space. No, you're grasping onto, I'm a person with such and such tendencies, and I'm kind of locked into that. And I'm locked into it from many perspectives, my own version of myself, how I, how I think other people perceive me, society, grasp. So when we experience anguish, because that's where all this began, that's when really painful minds are appearing and you're grasping at them and you're wrapping them into your self-association and then you're seeing, because it's objectively existing, you're seeing this kind of gap between you and everybody else and the whole cosmos and you're just filled with pain about yourself. Have you had this experience? Of course you have. <laughs> it's existential. And it's a hallucination. Because I do not exist objectively. I do not exist objectively. Each one of you is looking at your subjective version of me. I've got my subjective version of me. And nobody can find the objectively existing me. Nobody can find the objectively existing teaching. Nobody can find the objectively existing New York. We talk about like there's a New York, but all there are are millions of New Yorks. By the way, this is the best news you've ever heard. Because it finally means there's something we can do about things. That feeling of helplessness when we look out at the, this seemingly spiraling, divisive, uncontrolled world. There is no objectively existing, uncontrolled, divisive world. There's something you can do. Change your mind. Change your mind, change your world. Change your mind, change who you are. Change how you perceive me. Change how you perceive this situation. Change how you perceive New York City. Change your mind. The problem is that we're so locked into grasping, believing that we think 
our projection is correct. You know, we're so caught in, we're so grabbed because things appear as if they exist outside the mind, just like in a dream. In the moment you're dreaming, the dream appears as if it's real, doesn't it? That's why you run. You, you run when you're being chased by some assailant in a dream. Not because the assailant can hum, harm you, but because you believe and perceive that the assailant can harm you. A dream assailant cannot harm a dream you. But in that moment, you grasp, this is real. This is a real assailant. And Buddha said, everything is like a dream. In the sense that we perceive phenomena as existing outside the mind, of course, within the conventions of the dream, if you want to stay alive, get away from the assailant. <laughs> in the same way, in the conventions of when you're alive and awake, awake, if a car is coming towards you, don't just go, you're just a dream. Get out of the way. And then go, you're just a dream. Because <laughs> we want to take full advantage of being in this particular dream. Because in this particular dream, these We've met these teachings that are going to enable us to actually wake up. And that's an incredible good fortune. Anyway, why am I saying all this? Because, well, because it's the truth. <laughs> because what it helps us to do is to develop compassion. Develop compassion for everybody. For everybody. It's like they talk, you know, they, uh, in Buddhism we talk about the wheel of life. You ever heard that phrase, the wheel of life? And, it's, and Buddha actually drew a picture. I'm not sure where we have one. I think maybe we have one out there. But there's a, like a picture uh, describing it with all the different realms of existence. You could be reborn as an animal. You can be reborn as a hungry spirit. You can be reborn as like a god. So they, they have way better conditions than we do. But it's just the wheel of life. It never stops. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. So if someone's right at the top, but you know they're about to go down, would you say they're an object of compassion? They might be enjoying like fantastic conditions right now, but you can see, you can see, oh, any moment now, the wheel of life is going to keep spinning. It follows, doesn't it? If the person's suffering now, is an object of compassion, then the person who's about to suffer is also an object of compassion. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody's an object of compassion. Everybody. Like sometimes we might look at an old person who we can see is clearly suffering due to aging. Meanwhile, we see like young teenagers or whatever, full of vitality, youth, you know, and we're like kind of looking at them, maybe thinking, oh, look, oh, yo, aren't they so fortunate? Yeah. In the blink of an eye, that person is now that person. Every old person was once that young person, full of vitality. And it happens like that, doesn't it? Those of you of a certain tint in your hair will acknowledge happens like happens like that you know of course inter and internally right you still feel like you're young and with it until suddenly you see the photo of you actually hanging out with young people and you realize oh <laughs> they're looking at me like the old dude anyway These are very deep meditations, and what I would really like to encourage all of us to do, because th this runs counter to the grain, and it counter to sort of the societal influences that are basically telling you, like, take sides, you know, get angry at this. Like, really, like the news. The news is, is a compassion meditation. Don't let it be an anger meditation. Don't let it be an attachment meditation. Don't let it be an envy meditation. I mean, all of that can be churned up, but instead make it be a compassion meditation. Don't, don't start thinking, these are the bad guys and these are the good guys. Because the bad guys were once the good guys. The good guys are reborn. As the, it, it, never, it never stops spinning. I think I... 
in a previous section, I, I, I read to you that sto uh, story or kind of uh, image that Buddha uses of the, f the fisher, the fisher people, the fishermen, and the fish constantly swapping places in this one lake. You know, fishermen kill the fish, re the reborn as the fish, the fish are reborn as the fishermen and just constantly swapping places. To me, it's the most powerful political analogy you can possibly have. Because that's the thing. We think somehow, no, these people are, uh, people are inherently different from those people. No, they're not. Just temporary. Temporary. For as long as living beings are trapped inside a misapprehension of reality, believing that things exist in the way in which they appear, believing that, grasping at that, therefore believing I am this identity, you are that identity, as opposed to, no, we just swap places. No, I'm intrinsically male, I'm intrinsically white, I'm intrinsically this. All of that, temporary. We've been swapping places since beginning this time. And the... the, the, the axis upon which this wheel is spinning is delusion, misapprehension. If you look at the, the picture that Buddha drew of the wheel of life with the sort of different realms, and then right in the middle, in the hub of the wheel, there are uh, three animals. There's a, uh, 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 a snake, a pig, and a uh, I think sometimes it's like a pigeon, sometimes it's like a rooster or something like that, but let's say a pigeon. And uh, the, ig the pig represents ignorance, the snake, anger, and the pigeon, attachment. And those are the, what we call the three poisons, the three main delusions. The main one is ignorance, believing that things exist in the way in which they appear, like I described, like Believing that there's this objectively, because I, I appear like I'm objectively existing. Everything appears like it's objectively existing. So we believe that. That's ignorance, misapprehending reality. And on that basis, when we see something attractive, we think it's a source of happiness. I want it. So now I'm, I'm looking for happiness out there. Happiness comes from inner peace. So that's like the pigeon. Somebody gets between me and my object of attachment. I hate you. That's the, the snake. And they're just spinning one after another, over and over and over. For as long as we are in that wheel of life, which Buddha calls samsara, cyclic existence, we're trapped in a circle, ever cycling, trying to get away from suffering, but keep cycling back into it. Anyone in samsara, whether they're, at, they're temporarily at the top or at the bottom, is an object of compassion. Try it. Try it out for size. Try to use the news, for example, as a meditation on compassion for, for everyone. People creating, we read about people experiencing ripening effects of negativity that are causing so much pain and suffering, and then we see people creating negativity. And by the way, all of this, we, we never elevate ourselves beyond that. We all know. We're carrying all of that within us. Each and every one of us has experienced suffering, the ripening effects of negativity, and we have all engaged in negative actions due to anger, said hurtful things, said divisive things, been a bit deceitful. And if we haven't done it so much in this life, we've definitely done it in past lives. We're all carrying that experiences with us. We're never thinking, we never judge, we never, ever, ever judge another person. We just want to feel compassion. We judge delusions, and we feel that all, everybody is the victim of their delusions. Everybody is suffering because of those three. Ignorance, anger, attachment, and then that leads to jealousy and envy and pride and all of those minds. We're all carrying them inside, all due to a basic misapprehension of reality. And, what, and that, it's been going on lifetime after lifetime. That's why it's unbearable. You know, I read that, that uh, pure compassion feels the suffering of others to be unbearable. Because not only have we been 
you know, we've also meditated on this when we were meditating on love. We've had intimate connections with everybody. Everyone has been our mother. And therefore, we actually say, everyone still is your mother. My mother is now 87. If I meet my mother right now, she does not resemble the mother I had when I was four or whatever, you know? If I came home when I was four and my mother looked like she does now, I would not recognize her as my mother. But I don't, you know, if I meet up with my mother now, I don't go, you don't look like my mother. (laughs) She's changed, but she's still my mother. And even, you know, if she passes away before me, I'm still going to think of her as my mother. And if I was, if I was actually shown, like maybe some, you know, maybe some clairvoyant person was able to like introduce me to say to a, to a child and say, oh, this is the rebirth of your mother and convince me of that. You would have a, you'd have a different feeling about that person, wouldn't you? You would see a little kid, but you would actually kind of feel your mother within that person. And you would feel something close, right? You feel close. And so Buddha, he actually says, everyone has been your mother, but they've all changed now countless times, but they're still your mother. It's actually kind of like a metaphor, the fact that everybody finally, finally, naturally has a good heart. That's our nature. It's the nature of every living being. Everybody has a good heart. But the, we all have negativity, but the negativity is not natural to us. The negativity is coming from the misapprehension of reality. So that's how we try to look at the world. All these good-hearted living beings, who we've all been incredibly close to in previous lives, who are all just like us, they wish for happiness, they don't want to suffer. Nobody wants to suffer, but they keep creating suffering out of delusion. Everybody has Buddha nature. Everyone has the potential for freedom. Across the board. So we see some people are being harmed, some people are harming. And so the wheel of samsara spins round and round and round. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone, all my kind mothers, all these people who have Buddha nature, incredible potential, everyone who's longing for happiness and freedom just like me, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone could be free from suffering? And allow yourself to hold that experience of compassion in your heart for whoever. I know this is challenging, by the way. But that's cool. We need to be challenged. Because whatever we're doing at the moment isn't working. I don't know if you've noticed. I mean, imagine that, right? Imagine the whole world just decides, instead of hatred and division, let's feel compassion for everybody. Imagine that. Love and compassion. Let's not stop focusing on the differences. Let's just, just focus on the fact that we all have this commonality. We have a good heart. We're all wishing for happiness. We're all wishing for freedom. And the suffering and the harm and the, so forth, all coming from delusion. What we want to do is free living beings from delusion. That's why, by the way, you don't get discouraged. You don't develop depression. Like It doesn't make you unhappy to have compassion because you see the solution so clearly. There is actually a solution. I mean, how many situations are we looking at right now that feel like there's no solution? But there is actually a solution. We need to get rid of the delusions. And so initially we think, yeah, you all need to get rid of the delusions. (laughs) And then at some point you realize, oh, shoot, I guess that means me. I guess that means I need to get rid of my delusions. And that's where it starts. Out of compassion, 
we're given incredible energy, power, to actually affect change in ourself because we realize I can't help people for as long as I am part of the problem. And that's why it will lead to bodhicitta, the wish to attain enlightenment, the wish to remove the delusions from my mind and perfect the good qualities of kindness and love and wisdom and compassion. And it gives you power to affect that. Compassion will empower you every day of your life. If you feel inspired by this podcast, then dive deeper into timeless wisdom of modern Kadampa Buddhism by following the link in the episode description. We look forward to reconnecting with you in the next episode of Kadampa Podcasts.